for those of you who are not familiar with the American Blues Foundation, it was established in um, 1989 to deepen the understanding of the Druze people and also to preserve uh, the Druze cultural heritage. In uh, 2013, we established the first endowment fund ever, and we're better than here at the Center of uh, Contemporary Arab Studies at Georgetown University. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce uh, the director of the center, Dr. Feda Adeli. Thank you. I'm not as tall, so take this down. Thank you, Rabia. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Georgetown University. Um, so as has been said, my name is Fida Adeli, and I am the director of the Center for Contemporary Arab Studies, as well as the Clovis and Hala Salam Maksud Chair in Arab Studies. We are pleased again this year to partner with the American Druze Foundation for our annual lecture, featuring scholars invited in this year, featuring both our ADF postdoctoral fellow, as well as two other invited scholars that I'll introduce you to in a moment. Since 2016, ADF has generously supported a fellowship here at Georgetown University promoting research on the Druze and Arab minorities with a concentration in the political, economic, and social history of the Druze. The ADF fellowship supports academic research in the disciplines of history, political science, sociology, economics, anthropology, and archaeology. I should say that this year I'm also excited to announce a new initiative through a partnership with the ADF where we'll be launching a program for small, small research grants for young scholars at different stages of their career who are pursuing uh, Drew studies or are interested in pursuing Drew studies in some capacity as a way to kind of um, have a longer pipeline, let's say, right? So to engage with students at earlier in their career. So you'll be hearing more about that soon and we're excited about that future collaboration. So our annual American Jews Foundation lecture this year will feature a panel discussion under the theme, Generating Sectarianism, Occupation, War, and Intermarriage. The panel will feature the research of three esteemed scholars. First, I'd like to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Lara Deeb. Dr. Deeb is the Laura Vazenbinder Hockett Endowed Professor and Chair of the Department of Anthropology and the program in Middle East and North Africa studies at Scripps College. In addition to numerous articles and chapters, Deeb is the author of An Enchanted Modern Gender and Public Piety in Shia in Lebanon, published by Princeton University Press. She's also the co-author of several other volumes, including Leisurely Islam. Her latest book, Love Across, Dis Love Across Difference, Mixed Marriage in Lebanon is forthcoming from Stanford University Press this fall, and we look forward to hearing about some of that work tonight. Next, I'd like to introduce Dr. Maria Castreno. I hope I said that correctly. Dr. Castreno is a social anthropologist with fieldwork experience in South, the Southeastern Mediterranean, specifically in Syria, Greece, Lebanon, and the Israeli-occupied Golan Heights. Her research critically interrogates the politics, religion, sect, state, and statelessness, the political and cultural lives of refugees, and the political economy of conflict and resistance. Her monograph, Power, Sect, and State in Syria, was published in 2016 with I.B. Tiris, and is the first ethnography of the Druze minority in Syria, and one of only a handful of anthropological works about Syria. She has been engaged with projects on sectarianism, statelessness, and refugees in the Middle East, and she's currently working on the, with the Druze, or on the Druze uh, Heritage Foundation funded research uh, called Lives Across Divides, Ethnographic Stories from the Golan Heights. Finally, I'd like to introduce Dr. Dima Abisab, our ADF fellow this year. Dr. Abisab is uh, received her PhD from New York University in Middle Eastern and Islamic Studies with a focus in urban politics. She's currently working on her book manuscript based on research conducted for her dissertation um, entitled Geographies of War, Scalar Containment, Municipal Politics, and the Creation of Post-War Lebanon. 
Dima's project engages with the politics of scale as a framework from which to examine the legislative, territorial, and infrastructural maintenance involved in the production of sectarian governmentalities. She ex Dima explores the constitution of modern citizenship from a place of infrastructural precarity and delineates how sect-based militias use, these precar use this precarity as a blueprint for post-war Lebanon's governmentality. She thinks through the impact of the afterlives of violence and the experiences involved in navigating geographies of war by anchoring her study in several Jews' villages of Mount Lebanon. Dima's research and scholarship has been shaped by her engagement with municipalist networks from Manim, Manim Municipality to the Urban Democracy Lab at NYU. Okay, so at this point, I just wanna say, we will have time for questions at the end. I've introduced the speakers in the order that they will speak. Dr. Laura D will begin, um, and then we will have some time for questions, and then I'll come back to the podium to give us our instructions for the next step. Welcome again, and I'd like to welcome Dr. Deeb to the podium. Thanks. Good evening, everyone. Um, I want to start by some, giving some thanks also. So thank you first to Fida Adeli and Dima Abisab for inviting me to present in this forum with such an amazing group of scholars. And thanks also to Coco Tate for all the behind the scenes labor that went into bringing us all into this room together this evening. And of course, the American Druze Foundation for their support of this amazing panel. And all of you, thank you for being here um, to hear us and engage with us in conversation afterwards. It feels wrong to be talking about other anything other than how we can stop the Israeli genocide on Gaza right now. And of course, the continued escalation in the region, including Israel's destruction of South Lebanon's ecosystem through bombing water pumps and dams and filling the fields with white phosphorus. But we also must keep on keeping on. So with the caveat that I do not feel like this is business as usual, um, I am going to today share bits and pieces Work, yeah. Bits and pieces of my forthcoming book that um, Dr. Adeli just mentioned about mixed marriage in Lebanon. And I use the phrase mixed marriage to refer to intersectarian and interreligious marriage, frankly, just because it's a lot easier to say mixed marriage than that long phrase every time. I've been thinking about this book and doing participant observation for decades, although my first formal interview wasn't until 2012, and most of the interviews were done between 2016 and 2019. Since those interviews, people have lived through the hope and energy of the uprisings that began in October 2019, the counter-revolution and state suppression that followed, the COVID-19 pandemic, the trauma and destruction of the port explosion on August 4th, 2020, the earthquakes, and the economic collapse. That is not the focus of my talk today, but I can't share the stories I'll share without also mentioning that context and acknowledging the drastic and painful ways that the lives of almost everyone I interviewed for this book have changed in the meantime. In the book, I use mixed marriage stories to do two things, unravel the social construction of sect and show how changing gendered norms around marital choice affect this process. I show how, as parents object to mixed marriage, sect falls apart into other kinds of difference, like fears of rural villagers disrupting urban social worlds, or the unknown of one region of Lebanon infecting a family from another region, or class difference, or political disagreements. Each time a parent objects to their child's choice of spouse using the language of sect, that parent adds meaning to the category of sect. Their objections and arguments contribute to the cycle through which sect is constantly remade as the most important and visible and tip of the tongue category of social difference in Lebanon. Tonight, I'm going to do something a little different. I'll talk about those aspects of the book, but I'm going to do so through the question of why mixed marriage is sometimes more difficult or assumed to be more difficult for Druze than for other Lebanese. Overall, I've gathered around 200 stories about how Lebanese parents respond to mixed marriage. Parents of every sect cried, pleaded, feigned heart attacks, reasoned, argued, called on extended family or clerical pressure, used the silent treatment, threatened disownment, embarked on very avid matchmaking efforts, 
badgered their child's partner, restricted their child's movement, and very rarely threatened violence, all to express their opposition to mixed marriage. Most stories include some degree of parental opposition, and most of the time, parents eventually came around. Most of these parents don't practice their religion, and some are atheists. For most people, this is not about religious rules. Instead, what my book shows is that mixed marriage triggers intense resistance because it disrupts parents' expectations for their family's social and literal futures and challenges dominant ideas about love, patriarchy, sectarianism, and difference. At the same time, Lebanese have been marrying across religious lines for at least a century with significant increases in the late 1960s and early 70s, and then again in the 1990s, and even more so this century. The people I interviewed ranged in age, region of the country, and class, and came from all the major Lebanese sects. And 16% of them were Druze. At first, you might think that means that Druze are overrepresented in my interviews, because they are estimated to constitute only 5% of the Lebanese population. But this is in fact a close approximation of their representation in mixed marriages. As of 2018, 19% of interreligious marriages among Lebanese involved Druze, meaning that Druze are more likely per capita to marry outside their sect than other Lebanese. So let me, let's meet two of them now, Leila and Nadine, two Druze cousins who took different paths to mixed marriage. Ah, this is a different, there we go. Layla met Zayn, who is Muslim, when they were seniors at a private high school in Beirut in the early 1990s, but they didn't start dating until just after college. Layla knew her parents would disapprove. When she was in elementary school, she had a childhood crush on a classmate, and her mother responded, but remember, you will only marry a Druze. So she hid this relationship from her parents for years. Meanwhile, Layla's cousin, Nadine, met Rami, also Muslim, in an engineering class at AUB in the late 1990s. Just before graduation, they started dating casually. Nadine was clear from the start that she wasn't interested in marriage. And Rami's friends warned him not to get too serious about her. Nothing will come of this, they said. It's not worth it. Had Rami's, parents own, has Rami, Rami's own parents also given him a hard time, he might have taken those warnings more seriously. But they were supportive and he really liked Nadine, so he decided to wait and see what might happen. Eventually, both Layla's mom and Nadine's mom figured out who they were dating and asked them to end things, saying things like, you know where we come from, we can't handle this. You can't marry anyone who isn't Druze. Very different in personality and approach, Layla continued to date Zayn in secret, while Nadine continued to date Rami in the open. Why did Layla hide her relationship? Why did Rami's friends warn him away from Nadine and why did their mothers ask them to stop? For one thing, and I should say, I don't expect you to read what's up here. I'm just putting all these words up here to show you just how complicated this is in Lebanon. Lebanon is a complicated place to be a mixed couple. It has 18 official sectarian groups in a country the size of Los Angeles County, a political system built on sectarian difference, and a history of fraught politics and periodic violence. Plus, Lebanon has 15 personal status laws and no civil alternative. These are the laws for marriage, divorce, child custody, and inheritance. If you factor in that these laws also differ for men and for women, that's actually 30 different personal status laws in a system Maya McDashi calls sextarianism. So this slide again just shows you how complicated this can be. When a Lebanese citizen is born, they're assigned their father's sect and personal status category. Women can't pass citizenship or sect or personal status onto their children. So as you might imagine, this is complicated for all Lebanese and it makes mixed marriage even more complicated. But this is not actually why Leila lied and Rami's friends cautioned him. When I tell people that I'm in Lebanon that I'm writing about mixed marriage, they nearly always exclaim, the Druze are impossible. People caution one another about potential Druze entanglements. They draw on stereotypes to warn of violence fueled by uh, sensationalist stories circulating in the media, like one from 2012 about a Druze family that castrated a young man who eloped with their daughter. Everyone in Lebanon says Druze are supposed to only marry Druze. This Druze endogamy rule originates with religious belief. You are born Druze, no one can convert into the religion. Druze souls are reincarnated. 
Believers differ as to whether mixed marriage corrupts the original Druze soul or is evidence that the soul is already corrupted, but both views agree on the consequence, an eternal sentence as a non-believer, a condemned soul. Mixed marriage can also jeopardize future generations. Some people believe that only pure Druze inherit a Druze soul. Others believe that as long as the father is Druze, the child might be impure, but remains Druze. And here, this belief lines up with the state's patriarchal inheritance rules for sect. But here's the thing. Druze who believe in reincarnation generally do not marry non-Druze. And none of my Druze interviewees and very few of their parents knew much or cared much about any of these spiritual consequences for mixed marriage. So let's go back to Layla and Nadine for a moment. Layla eventually told Zayn that the only way they could marry was if they left Lebanon. So he found a job in Canada and moved. Then he called Layla's father to propose. He told him he would fly to Beirut to ask in person if he was willing to see him. He explained that neither he nor Layla identified with their sect, that they belonged to a culture that was Ras Beirut and secular. He added that they would be outside the country, far from Lebanese eyes and gossip. Her father still refused, saying, even if you go to the moon, everyone knows me in the village. Everyone will know you are Shia. So one morning soon after, Layla left home as though she were going to swim her usual laps at the gym. She left her parents a note and boarded a flight. Before her plane landed in Canada, Zane's phone was ringing nonstop. For weeks, her parents begged her to return. Instead, the couple married, making their elopement a done deal. It took Layla's mother over a year to speak with her again, in an emotional reunion facilitated by her siblings. Her dad was intransigent and under a great deal of pressure from senior male relatives to refuse reconciliation. So eight years later, Layla forced his hand by just showing up one afternoon at her parents' house. Her father teared up and began speaking with her again. A couple years after that, Layla and Zane brought a toddler with them on a family vacation. By the end of that week, it was as though nothing unusual had happened. Meanwhile, her cousin Nadine had decided she actually did want to marry Rami. Her parents knew and liked him. He had been hanging around the house for years, but the couple worried they would still reject a proposal. Nadine had seen the impact of Layla's elopement on her aunt and uncle, and she didn't want to put her parents through that. She and Rami weren't in a hurry, so they just kept dating openly and focused on their careers. Nadine's father tried to set her up with other people, and she just ignored him. By the time they had been together for over a decade, it was clear to everyone that Nadine and Rami were going to marry. They were in their 30s, Nadine had just accepted a job outside Lebanon, and her parents had basically resigned themselves to the fact. Privately, they treated Rami as a fiancé. There was no formal proposal or acceptance. The couple informed Nadine's parents that Rami would be adjoining her abroad. Marriage was understood and Nadine's father wished them the best, but still didn't give his blessing. The religious explanation for Drew's intransigence doesn't work for these families. They live in Ras Beirut, an area of the capital lauded by many as especially mixed and open-minded. Nadine, Layla, and their parents, and Zayn and Rami had all attended the exact same private secular schools and universities. Parents, daughters, and sons-in-law all fall somewhere between agnostic and atheist. The problem was that both Nadine and Layla's parents remained connected to family and village networks. Such networks can exert social and economic pressure on parents whose children violate the marriage rules. Complex Lebanese inheritance laws often mean that property is jointly owned by multiple people, an array of siblings and cousins that expands with each generation. Sometimes one person's authorized to act on behalf of the group and controls the distribution of funds from property rents or sales. If the people holding the purse strings are unhappy about a marriage, they can use their financial power to oppose it. Layla and Nadine's fathers, who are brothers, are linked to precisely that kind of a kinship-based economic network. They needed the, the income it generates, so they treaded cautiously. To this day, even though cousins who live in Beirut know and like both couples, their parents have never publicly acknowledged their marriages in the village. By remaining silent, they indicate their disapproval of the situation, and that disapproval is necessary to maintain their place in those networks. Indeed, one of the things I show is that for most parents of all sects, fear of damage to their own social worlds was a primary factor fueling their opposition to mixed marriage. Okay, we still also need to take seriously some people's belief that mixed marriages contribute to the dwindling of their communities in the world. 
Lebanese who are politically minded worry that it will reduce their sect's numbers and therefore political clout and resources within Lebanon's sectarian system. And these worries are not unique to Druze, but are shared by many Christians as well. The fear of losing numbers in the world hinges on the idea that identity is only inherited biologically. Conversion, which is fairly common in Lebanon, breaks that idea. Oh, I'll get there. Breaks that idea of heredity for Christians, except for Armenians, but it doesn't work for Druze. The problem with using fears of minority disappearance to explain opposition to mixed marriage is gender. So yes, if a Druze woman marries outside the sect, and here we have the most famous example on the screen behind me, numbers will be lost. But if numbers matter, it should be acceptable for Druze men to marry non-Druze women because the couple's children will be Druze. And this logic is actually why many Druze in Lebanon support civil marriage. Ironically, the community's major political leader, Walid Jimblat, and his son, Taymor, both converted to Islam to marry Muslim women. So technically, they shouldn't count as Druze anymore, nor should their children, but their status protects them. The more capital you hold, political, economic, or social, the easier it is to get away with mixed marriage. But for everyone, the fact that Lebanese inherit sect only through their father, plus patriarchal norms related to controlling women's sexuality, should mean that men can marry outside sect more easily than women. And it is true that in most sects, mixed marriage was easier, though not always easy, for men. But again, not for Druze. Druze parents protested the mixed marriages of their sons just as intensely as and regularly as those of their daughters. And among my interviewees, just as many Druze grooms eloped as Druze brides. So Hisham is one of them. He and his Muslim girlfriend spent months convincing her father to give his blessing to their engagement. Until that point, his parents had ignored the relationship. But when engagement became a real possibility, they changed their tune. Hisham's parents had never lived in their village, but were terrified about what people there would say about them. For months, his mother called him every day, crying and begging him to leave Maya. She called Maya too, saying things like, he's not rich, what are you after him for? She threatened that they would never be happy. The couple tried reasoning with his mom. They enlisted help from supportive relatives. And finally, Hisham eloped with Maya with her parents' permission. So Maya likes to say, Ana khataftu, flipping the gendering of the, the word for uh, elopement in Arabic. Khatife, uh, but so she flips the gender of it. Um, where am I? Only one great uncle stopped speaking to his parents, but they waited until Maya was pregnant to reconcile with the couple. Once I first heard Hisham's story and other stories where a Druze man faced intense opposition to his choice of spouse, I thought it might reflect gender equity in Druze antagonism to mixed marriage, but it turns out it's more complicated. While Druze parents do oppose mixed marriage for their sons and daughters to similar degrees, far fewer Druze daughters try to marry someone of a different sect in the first place. Patriarchal pressures prevented them from dating or made them hesitate before breaking the rules. But that might be changing because my 2018 data shows more Druze women in mixed marriages than Druze men for the first time. So in 2013, I have data also, and that was more Druze men than Druze women. So it seems to have flipped in 2018. I also found that where a Druze person lives, the village versus Beirut versus diaspora, affects mixed marriage for women more than men. Women living in villages are under closer scrutiny than those in urban areas. Urban Druze women, especially highly educated ones, often feel like they've escaped village constraints. But once a mixed couple starts to move towards marriage, all those gender differences in pressure fade. Adnan is Druze and his wife Zina is Shia. When the couple started dating as undergrads, Adnan was clear with Zina that he would never marry her. He had seen his older brother's heartbreak when his mom secretly met with his older brother's fiance and convinced her to break up with him. He didn't want to deal with his family. Zina was okay dating just for fun. She was too young to think about marriage. So whenever the couple thought they were growing too serious, they broke up. A few months later, they would cross paths at a party and get back together. Their parents knew about the relationship and just assumed it would fizzle out with time. Three years later, Zina changed her mind and decided she wanted more and broke up with Andan for real. A year later, they were dating again. 
This time, Adnan's parents realized that Zina kept resurfacing. They began to fight with him every weekend when he drove from Beirut to have lunch with them in the village. Another three years went by, and Zina was done with the uncertainty. This time, she broke up with Adnan for good and actually started dating someone else. Adnan went crazy with jealousy and did his best to convince her to come back to him. It took a year and a friend's intervention to convince Zina to give him one last chance. At this point, it had been eight years since the couple began dating. They stayed together, but it took another four years for them to marry. The problem in Adnan's family was not economic reliance on social networks. It was status. Adnan's father's professional career and his grandfather's before that positioned them as village patriarchs, role models, mediators, and advisors on matters from health to inheritance conflicts to personal disputes. Adnan took his position as the son of a man of this status very seriously. He understood and for years accepted that he was expected to hold certain views and uphold certain traditions, including marrying someone Druze. It took him over a decade to release himself from those expectations. He never told his parents he was engaged. He just let the village gossip network do that work for him. When his father finally said, so I have to learn from strangers that you're getting married, they talked. Adnan's father surprised him. He was willing to meet Zina and then visit her family to propose formally. During their initial meeting, Adnan's parents explained to Zina that they feared Adnan would neglect his wejbet, his formal social obligations. Zina reassured them that she wouldn't allow that lapse and would support Adnan in his village role. A month later, on a plane full of relatives, a, co- a plane full of relatives accompanied the couple to Cyprus for the wedding because Cyprus is the only place you, or the closest place you can get a civil marriage if you are Lebanese. There's no civil marriage in the country. Adnan and Zina's path was among the longest from meeting to marriage, in large part because social status was important to him, not only to his parents. When he finally decided he was ready to marry Zina, all the pieces fell into place. And once his father accepted the match, everyone else in the village fell in line. In families like this one, whose status hinged on a key role they played in a village or town, it was more often the marriage of a son that triggered parental protests. An inherited position of patriarchal authority that extended beyond family was at stake. There's another way that gender also matters. Shunning is extremely powerful and its impact falls disproportionately on women in a family. The fear of shunning rarely came to full fruition, but just the possibility that it might happen terrified parents. While fathers worried about status or economic consequences, mothers bore the brunt of backlash from relatives, friends, and neighbors. They were the ones on the phone or at the neighbor's house fielding questions, being scolded, or overhearing gossip about their child. The experience of widowed mothers, who often fought mixed marriage with all they had, highlights this parental gender difference. The weight of potential family censure piled onto the weight of facing a major parenting moment without their husband. Dia's husband passed away a few years before her son, Fadi, fell in love with Joanna, who is not Druze. Fadi told me, my mom literally had a nervous breakdown when I told her about Joanna. She started having spasms and crying like it was a medical reaction. Although Dia remained overwrought for years, the conversation she had with Fatty changed over that time. At first, she maintained it was a sin to marry a non-Druze. Fatty pointed out that he and his siblings had been raised without religion and that when they had asked their parents as teenagers if they could marry a non-Druze, the parents had always said, it's your decision. So confronted with this contradiction and her own stated agnosticism, Dia acknowledged that social pressure was behind her objections. So she switched to guilt. Why are you doing this to me? Your dad passed away. Why do you want me to suffer like this? When Fatty continued to date Joanna, she tried concern. You'll end up divorced. Why why do this to yourself? When Fatty proposed to Joanna, Dia agreed to have lunch with the couple to meet her. The next day, she tried personal attack. The problem isn't that she isn't Druze, but I just don't see what you see in her. Fatty drew on reserves of patience to try to lift the weight from his mom's shoulders. Eldest son of an only son, he had inherited patriarchal family authority. When he informed his paternal aunts about his engagement, they voiced only mild concerns. But later, his mother heard far worse from them. Dia also faced pressure from her own parents and siblings, plus the broader village community. She held firm for months, refusing to see Joanna again. 
Eventually, something shifted, and Dia agreed to the match. She attended the civil ceremony abroad and the party in Beirut. So I met Dia at a cafe about a year and a half after Fatty and Joanna's wedding. She explained that her, she and her husband were more open-minded than their families and had raised their children abroad without adherence to sect. When her husband passed away, Dia and her children moved back to Lebanon, and that's when the social pressure began. My husband wasn't here to support me and support any diversion from the norm, she explained. If he were still alive, it would have been much easier because we could have handled the pressure together. But I wasn't ready to take it all on myself, to take all the pointing at me. You know, until I was forced face to face with the reality of their marriage, I wasn't going to change my mind. From the moment I felt the relationship was serious to the moment it became a done deal, I was very negative toward Fatty. I was hoping that by pressuring him, I would be able to change his mind. To be honest, I also felt that this would protect me from society, that people would see me fighting, saying no, refusing to give him my blessing. So society would say she did what she could. Dia was right. Eventually, her brother saw her anguish and encouraged her to accept Joanna so as not to lose her son. That's why she eventually gave her blessing and went to the wedding. Dia attributes her family's support eventually, to her strong stance against the marriage in the first place. She said, they all understood that I did what I should do, but I couldn't stop it. If at first I had just said, I have no problem with this and threw a wedding for him, of course they would have boycotted me and stopped talking to me. Instead, when they saw me suffering, my brother came and stood with me. She continued, I just didn't want to be the odd person out in society because I'm alone. This is where I live. These are the people I drink coffee with every morning. Let this problem be my son's choice and not mine. Parents can be punished for their children's violations of the social rules. And as Dia understood, opposition may well be the key to holding relationships together. Many parents oppose a marriage, tell people they did, embrace the ensuing sympathy, and then, as soon as it's all over, accept the situation. I did what I had to do. I did my duty. So let me wrap up. The stories I've shared show us the power of social pressure and shunning to shape parental responses. Throughout my research, parents of all sects articulated that fear of being shunned. None of this is specifically about being Druze. The factor that holds the particular set of stories I shared this evening together is not shared sect, but rather shared connection to village networks. Mixed marriages trigger a fear of being cast out of those networks, whether that means losing the economic benefits, the social support, or the status that comes with them. It may be that historical patterns of residence and migration mean that Drew's families are more likely than others to hold such ties, but that doesn't make their objections specifically about sect. When the Lebanese state and people as well rely on sect to categorize people, we lose sight of factors that give sect as a social category meaning in the first place like status, economic networks, and social support systems, as well as factors I didn't talk about today, like class, region of origin, or urban village differences. I wrote the book that this talk is, that this talk is from during what can only be called dark times for Lebanon and much of the world. Dark times shed light on what Hiba Abu Akar calls the intertwinement of hope and despair. So I'm gonna try for some hope in the last few sentences. My interviews show us that one way to put sect back in its place, where it is one kind of difference among many. Doing that might bring us a step closer to dislodging sect from its position as the keystone of governance and disrupting its deployment by political parties against the public good. At minimum, we will be one step closer to refusing to buy into the sharp cleavages and notions of irreconcilable irrecon difference propagated by the political elite in Lebanon as a weapon used to divide us. So that is where I will end, and I thank you all for listening. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm honored to be here at the annual um, um, 
American Jewish Foundation Conference hosted by the Center for Contemporary Arab Studies at Georgetown University. Thank you, Dima, Fida, and Coco. Um, and thank you all of you who are here tonight. This presentation provides a vantage point onto the stateless of the Golan Heights, often um, referred to as Israel's forgotten occupation. This presentation further provides a vantage point onto the stateless, um, oh, I said that, sorry, uh, how parallel um, through their voices and the lives of the inhabitants of Jolan and parallel to the histories of this possession and the violence of war, run the stories of people who are shaped and sometimes shape the currents they find themselves in, how they inhabit conflict and contradiction, resist and remember, survive and push through the gray lines. Besides, anthropology is not about proving something wrong or right, but about arranging and sharing the experiences of the people that you've had the chance to meet and live with. So, in this talk, I will start by saying a few words about my research background before bringing you the voices from the stateless Syrians in the Golan Heights, a small flavor of their lives under occupation. In the post-Ottoman formation of nation states and borders, Greece, where I come from, often shares something of the political history of revolutions, dictatorship, and the meddling of international powers that Arab countries have also experienced. And with this in mind, I was always drawn to our Eastern neighbors, whose wars frequented our TV channels, but whose music, food, and family structures, among other things, we shared. And so I started my anthropological journey in 2008, when I lived and I did my ethnographic work for a couple of years in Syria, the majority of which was spent living in the Druze suburb of Jaramana in Damascus. I had not said to study the Druze, but by chance I was welcomed and taken in by the family of a friend. And since then, I've been grateful that as an outsider, I've had the opportunity to walk in other people's shoes for some time. This research formed the argument of my first book that uh, provided an ethnographic and historical grounding of sect-state relations in pre-war Syria through the lived uh, violent intimacies that constructed the body and marriage as complex and pivotal sites of personal, communal, and political struggle. It was during that time that I first met university students from the occupied Syrian Golan who under a special agreement between Syria and Israel were allowed to visit and stay in Syria for the duration of their degree and only to go back over the border at the end, never to return again. I became good friends with these often critical and politicized students who explained to me that, and that's a quote, in the Jolan, we drink politics with our morning coffee. We kept in touch and from 2015, I have been visiting and writing about the Syrian Golan. And there are a lot of reasons um, why I have found this research especially compelling. Stateless since the Israeli occupation of the Golan Heights during the Six Days War of 1967, 57 years ago now, the Syrian Druze have persevered dispossession and occupation, and they continue to fight for their liberation and return to Syria. Indeed, they appear to be an example of defying sectarian stereotyping and the contemporary widespread sectarianization in the region. So my theoretical question became, can sectarianism actually exist without and outside of the nation state? Now, this presentation is based on uh, my current project, Lives Across Divides, Ethnographic Stories from the Golan Heights, which is based on life stories and narratives of those currently living in the occupied Jolan, as well as refugees from the Golan Heights. What is belonging to them and how do they reflect on the movement of borders and on their own movements between different countries and different states? As an anthropologist, I collect stories across divides and between wars. The stories people tell about themselves and others, how they tell them, and the ways that these stories can sometimes challenge or resist the tank and the factory, the gun, the border, the wall. In short, how people in most places, but especially in what Munira Hayat aptly calls landscape of war, resist the attempts of walling in, which is an expression that I borrow from Glenn Bauman. Um, and 
and close, resist and close, resist and cessation and re resist pacification. So how are the stateless Syrians um, of the Jolan experience life? And why do ethnic cleansing and genocide reverberate as strongly there as in Palestine and Israel? I will build my presentation um, through two ethnographic cases and a discussion. The first is called Hayel's Tomb. If you live, live free or die like the trees standing up. This, a verse from a song by Samik Shukair, the Syrian Druze musician, is carved onto the tombstone of Hayel Abu Zaid, who died, the epitaph continues for resistance and hope. Hayel is one of the martyrs and revolutionaries from the Jolan who dedicated his life to the cause of liberation from Israeli occupation. At 1,200 meters of elevation, the Jolan interconnects inter Syria, Lebanon, and Israel. Famous for its apples, cherries, water, and wine, it is a place of war and conflict caught in the crossfire today between Israel, Hezbollah, and Syria. Drums punctuate everyday life with their constant humming. Missiles are fired and sometimes fall. So this is, I'll read a message from my friend Kamel, who was sent to me last Sunday. I quote, it was very tense and difficult night because of the missiles and drones that exploded in the sky of Majd al-Shams. The children are very afraid and we were in great fear all of the time of the missiles falling into the town. On the same day, another friend wrote, the ping pong has turned into tennis, referring to the exchange of rockets and missiles during Iran's recent attack on Israel. Occupation, ethnic cleansing, and resistance have deep resonance among the stateless Jolanis. From the very start of Israel's invasion during the Arab-Israeli War of 1967, ethnic cleansing was an important strategy of war and occupation. 95% of the Syrian indigenous population was forcibly displaced, and only five villages out of 340 villages and farms remained. I have brought um, a map uh, or the recent up-to-date map from Al Marsad showing the, uh, the destroyed villages uh, for anyone who wants to look after. In uh, 1981, Israeli unilaterally and illegally annexed the Jolan. In response, the locals lay rebelled and staged a huge six-month strike during which during which under the Israeli snipers and starvation techniques, they were able to self-organize and create the basis for autonomous cooperatives. Um, so see, here is a, a picture of the strike or of the, one of the demonstrations in 1982. And here's an example of the kind of resistance of water, um, farming cooperatives such as apples uh, and so on. Today, there are 29,000 Israeli settlers in 35 illegal settlements. They control 95% of the land. The remaining indigenous population is 28,000. They live in five villages, four of which are Druze, and control 4% of the land. Most have not accepted Israeli citizenship. Their status is legally the same of that of the Palestinians in East Jerusalem. They are permanent residents in Israel. They don't have passports, but laissez-passer documents where their nationality is undefined. Although the Druze villages were spared the worst of the forced eviction and dispossession afflicted by the Israeli army on the, re on the rest, they were and they have been subject to significant expropriations of land, human rights violations and discrimination. They are human shields, the people of there, because everybody, uh, it's a military zone. And there's a recent fight over green grabbing of the Israeli state of their lands. Because of the community's resistance, though, most of the men above the age of 50 that I have spoken to have either been arrested or have been imprisoned in Israeli jails. Hayel's story is thus a case in point. Hayel 
was part of the first underground group that was formed at the start of the occupation. Caught by the Israeli army in the ambush at the border, he spent 20 years in prison and was released when he was about to die from cancer. Salman, who was his uh, comrade and was guiding me around the cemetery at the sunny afternoon last May, was quick to emphasize the political use of the term Shahid as someone who, I quote, died for the principle of resistance, mukauma, not for virgins in paradise, end of quote, indicating the uncomfortable relationship between the political resistance movement in the Golan and yet materializing and embodying a connectedness to the Palestinian struggle forged through shared uh, experiences in prison by reappropriating its aesthetics and mar martyrdom narratives. Civilian vi victims of violent deaths, including victims of landmines along the border zones with Syria, are also considered martyrs. The graves dedicated to the martyrs are prominent, personalized, and evocative memorials following typical modern political Islamic aesthetics that occupy more space than the uniform widowless ossuaries where the vast numbers of the, community of the community's dead collectively lie. So this, these are the osheries. And this is the memorialized, uh, the martyrs uh, commemoration. Next to his, uh, to Hagel's tomb is the commemorative plaque for Amir Abu Jobal, a boy of five years who was killed by an Israeli mine near his home. Salman tells me that he remembers vividly that he was tasked with retrieving Amir's body. He shows me by making his arms the shape of a cradle. He says, I kept looking at his nose and mouth. He looks like my son. That night, I did not sleep. I kept looking at my own son. The cemetery of Masdal Shams bears witness to long-term exchanges between the living and the dead, telling us who is a martyr and a hero and what it means to be remembered. Now the next uh, section is called, what is being Jolani? The complexity of citizenship and belonging. Israel wants us to be Druze, explained Fahed, the president of a local autonomous organization during an interview. Israeli Druze. Here, being Israeli Druze means being compliant to the Israeli authority. And an aspect of the Israeli propaganda is its claim that Jolanis do not take citizenship because they are afraid of repercussions from the Syrian regime should the Golan return to Syria. Yet, None of my interlocutors has ever mentioned this reason. Instead, I remember vividly during the height of the Syrian war in 2015, a man turning around and telling me, we will still be Syrians, even if Syria ceases to exist. Like inside Syria, Jolanis underwent a similar process of anti and pro regime protests. While more recently, from this August, some have been protesting in solidarity to the ongoing protests in Sueda. Yet, on the basis of local estimates, between 10 and 25 percent of Jolanis have accepted Israeli citizenship. The vast majority of Syrians in the Golan Heights, however, remain stateless. Getting Israeli citizenship is a contentious subject for a community that is known for its resistance to Israeli occupation, as Mason and all have said in their recent book. Yet, taking Israeli citizenship has increased after the Syrian war, but I argue it happens for complex and sometimes contradictory reasons. For example, out of losing hope, or to be able to work within the Israeli job market and advance one's career, or sometimes to protect one's land rather than because people feel Israeli. In the 80s and 90s, it was the norm in the Jolan that people who took Israeli citizenship suffered a serious so social death. They were branded traitors and collaborators and excommunicated from social and religious affairs. Jawad's father was one of the first people in Majdal Shams to publicly declare his support for Israel 
and one of the first and only one of the very few people to to um, yeah, to, to, to get at that time Israeli citizenship. He lost most of his business and social capital in doing so. And I interviewed him. When I interviewed uh, Joad um, in his beautiful traditional Syrian restaurant, he mentioned bitterly that when his father died, the local religious sheikhs refused to carry out the mortuary prayers and rituals. The family had to bring in Israeli Druze sheikhs from the Galilee. Yet, when I asked him where he feels his identity lies, he replied that he feels Syrian, even though he has Israeli citizenship. And like most people who have acquired Israeli citizenship in the Jolan, Jawad does not serve the, in the Israeli occupation forces. He says, I don't like the army. I'm a pacifist. But the reasons for taking on Israeli citizenship are so complex and doing so does not mean people's acquiescence to occupation. Rawad, another young man in his late 20s, took Israeli citizenship so that he would not lose his lands after living outside the country for many years. I did so that, so that Israeli does not confiscate my land, he told me. Rawad also told me another story, how he recalled his past life as a Lebanese Drew soldier who fell from enemy fire during the civil war. During Israel's occupation of southern Lebanon, Rawad was able to travel and find his family from the previous life. Now they keep in touch through a WhatsApp group. But Rawad was uneasy with this past life. A self-described atheist, he tried to find rational explanation for his close connections to Lebanon. I guess I've always wanted to go to Lebanon, he said. Of course, the Druze are familiar with the liminal space that the reincarnation called Takamus opens up, and how Takamus transgresses not only the boundaries between life and death, body and soul, but also the spatio-temporal borders of nation states. For us, death does not exist and Takamus keeps us close. Eleonor Armanet's Druze interlocutors from the Galilee note. Encapsulated in expressions like we are all relatives here or we are born in each other's houses, Druze stories of reincarnation tie together a community that finds itself divided by borders of occupying nation states. On the, in the Jolan, remembering past lives that have been violently cut short becomes a way of fostering expansive relations across securitized and often imper impenetrable borders, walls, and generations. Although Rawad's reincarnation story crossed state borders, he's considered his connection to Lebanon and Syria more a result of acculturation than an immortal calling. Quote, I always wanted to go to Lebanon, but I think it is more Feirouz, the Lebanese singer, than this. End of quote. And yet, he continued to have an emotional connection with his family from the past life. He says, quote, they call me Habibi, and my mother from that generation cries a lot when she hears me. We talk on WhatsApp. Reincarnation narratives like Rawad's open up the past to the present, allowing new what, what uh, Amira Mitimayr calls history tellings to emerge. Being both here and there, these liminal embodiments create uneasy emotions for both reincarnated individuals and those around them. Embodied reincarnations reverse the expected order of things. Children, for example, having wives and fiances, children having children, children in possession of intimate cultural knowledge from across state borders. This indeed is a space of anti-structure, where kinship norms and social expectations of status and, and uh, respectability are reversed, an insurgent space of reversals and revolts based on the periciastic narratives of children and the cosmological questioning of territorial borders. And yet, narratives of reincarnation do not have a ritual closure, even when their barriers like Rawad, chose not to believe them, 
they are acted upon and continue to exist as possibilities of forms of alternative that can radically expand one's relations of kinship, space, and time, challenging enclosure and pacification. So this brings me to, to um, the last discussion. So we've seen Syrian connections. We will always be Syrian even if Syria does not exist. We've seen Palestinian connections in prisons and in cemeteries. We've seen Lebanese connections, Feirouz and reincarnation. These connections to the people and to the land and through the land are complex and multifaceted and cannot be reduced to Druze or nation's citizenship or even secular leftist revolutionary convictions. The identities here that I find are truly really dynamic, autonomous, uh, I would say insurgent, and they are very heterogeneous. In short, they are the antithesis of the settler colonial assumptions that their occupiers have fosters. And I want to focus on, on on this last section on how this is done and what it can tell us about sectarianism and ethnic cleansing in the Golan Heights and in Palestine. So Edward Said critically noted um, that by defining something that you, you rule and lay claim over it. And in this section, I want to leave a moment the complexity of people's lived experiences as ethnographically described above and return to this colonial logic about religion. Why only Druze villages were allowed to stay in 1967? They believe that uh, the Druze would be compliant parents Israel had already by 1949 achieved an alliance with religious Druze elites in the regions of Carmel and Galilee, as historian Kai Sfiro has demonstrated in his book, The Druze in the Jewish State. Accordingly, uh, Israeli army officials believed that the Druze would inflict a stab in the back of Arabism. This alliance with the state of Israel isolated the Druze community in Israel from their core religionists um, and brothers in Syria and Lebanon. And in exchange for becoming the political representatives of a new religious ethnicity, the sectarianization of the political identity in the greater context of what Yiftachel calls the Israeli ethnocracy, it was molded and, the, and hence the Israeli Druze thus created as a category. The creation of the Israeli Druze identity, as opposed to the Palestinian Druze, became henceforth an ongoing project between local Druze elites and the Israeli state, a project of producing ethnic difference in the process of what Kai Sfiro again calls inventing religious traditions. To give you an example of this, underscoring the strategic importance of such alliance, Simon Perez, uh, otherwise known as the Butcher of Beirut, writes in 1977, a strong alliance, and this is a quote, a strong alliance is binding the Druze people with our people. Tradition has placed these sites to the time of Moses and Jethro, his father-in-law, who is the prophet, the prophet Swaib. The creation of the state of Israel has offered opportunities to these spiritual tides to be renowned, renewed and re reaffirmed. The Druzes who stand shoulder to shoulder with our sons in the defense of our country are extending a tradition of friendly relations." End of quote. And so through this kind of religious normalization, the Israeli Druze were the first Arabs to be trusted um, to serve in the Israeli Defense Forces, and until recently, uh, the only Arabs to be conscripted to do so, even though this is um, a, a problematic and, and very, um, um, yeah, very, very much explored uh, um, through Rodan and Canaan's work uh, surrounded. Uh, so it's more complex. Their so-called loyalty to the state of Israel turned Drew's identity into a laboratory 
for the manufacturing of sectarian difference under almost a libertarian democratic cloak. Um, as the Israeli state and military worked hand in hand with local elites to produce and fund new Druze traditions, as well as a comprehensive and specifically Druze educational curriculum to educate the new generations, um, as it has been explored through but with the work of Terabia, for example. While this project was successful in funding the architecture of religious politics, it has not much done to address the chronic poverty and impoverishment of the, of the people in the region. Indeed, the Druze in Israel continue to be second-class citizens living under a settler colonial apartheid state. And as such, all states' policies are essentially discriminatory on the basis of religion, as shown during the 2018 Druze protests against the Jewish national state law. Underpinning the process now of ethnic cleansing in the Golan Heights and the sectarianization of political identities that Israel undertook lies a simple colonial logic, that of homogeneity. The logic assumes that there is one homogeneous Druze community running through the occupied Golan and the Druze villages in northern Israel. But this assumption is simplistic, filled with colonial connotations, I same religion, same everything else. And this is the logic that was used from the very start, however, of the Zionist project, with ethnic cleansing ongoing since its inception, as Ilan Pape has demonstrated. It is the same logic extended that we see today by Israel explaining the large-scale genocide of Palestinians in Gaza. When we hear that it is the entire nation, that it is responsible, and that there are no innocents in Gaza, and that Gaza is filled with human animals, this is the logic behind it. So between the uh, genocide in Gaza and the forgotten occupation in the Golan, there is this underlying assumption of homogeneity within religious and ethnic groups. But of course, creating a homogeneous, religious, pure social entity is a risky, unstable business. The French had already tried it. During the colonial mandate, they divided Syria into territorial chunks so that on the basis of the colonial assumption of obedience in exchange for religious homogeneity. It was at the end of the Ottoman Empire and the establishment of Western colonialism and imperialism in the Middle East that what Osama Magdisi calls the culture of sectarianism was born as a thoroughly new and modern phenomenon. And as it was born, it was also resisted. The Syrian revolt against the French colonial rule was started in the Druze province by a Druze, Sultan Basa al -Atras, one of the greatest Syrian national heroes. During that time, the French collectively punished the Druze for their disobedience by burning down the village of Majdal, the village of Majdal Shams in the Golan and collectively punishing its inhabitants. Indeed, it was this memory that was recounted again and again to me in interviews as a deterrent for villages in leaving their village during the 1967 invasion. No one wants to be uprooted twice. As with French colonialism, the Israeli occupation operation to ethnically cleanse the Golan Heights and to homogenize Druze identity in exchange for obedience did not go to plan. Even monuments, have a habit of being troublesome entities in the Golan Heights. At the heart of Mas del Shams is uh, Hassan Hatter's statue, the March al Muhadira. It depicts Sultan Bashar al Atras, surrounded by contemporary figures such as a man of letters, next to a traditionally dressed man, a mother holding her dying son, a new martyr of the resistance. On the back of the statue, there are three kids, the future, holding books and wheat. The whole village came together in the darkness of night to install it one night in 1987. When they got word that the Israeli authorities were about to arrive and prohibit its installation, 
people used whatever tools they had, even mixing cement with their bare hands, while Tarabi, an artist and student of Hader at the time, told me. However, a few days later, in the darkness of a night, a loud explosion was heard. People discovered that the cannonball had been fired at the statue. With the village's help, the artist repaired the monument, leaving the dent of the cannonball as the embodiment of the violence of occupation and the resistance of the locals. And you can see it at the body of the, of the, of the uh, martyr there. So history teaches us that colonial experiments with religious homogeneity lead to settler colonial projects of ethnic cleansing and genocide, like the televised genocide in Gaza and the occupation of the Golan Heights. Look closer, though, in the continuities of everyday practices and the threads of another history become visible, the history of ordinary resistance and sumud steadfastness. Instead of religious homogeneity, the threading theme in the Golan is perhaps resistance to outside occupiers. The French missed that, and so did the Israelis. Thank you. Let me see what I can do. If not, I could just hold it. Move it to the side and then. Sure. Thank you so much. Yeah. Every ten seconds. Hi everyone. Um, I want to start by thanking you all for being here. Uh, it's nice to see some familiar faces in the crowd. Um, and I want to express my deep gratitude uh, to the American Druze Foundation for supporting and funding uh, the American Druze Foundation Fellowship here at Georgetown University, which has given me and many other early career scholars the opportunity to continue to research uh, Druze communities and to hold events such as this one. So thank you again. Uh, today, I'm going to be talking about some of the research I conducted in a few Druze villages in Mount Lebanon um, to invite us to think through how various events of the Lebanese Civil War of 1975 to 1990 affected the production of sectarianized space amongst the Druze communities of Mount Lebanon. I use informal and formal checkpoints that emerged with the onset of the Civil War as the point of departure to think about how violent circumstances shaped how people experienced, navigated, and produced space and community. In assessing the representational and affective implications of checkpoints on the built environment and in the ontological and on the ontological experiences of moving through space, I'm arguing today that a spatial ethnography of Lebanon's wartime landscape becomes essential to understanding how scales of containment become central in fostering a sense of safety and community. By thinking through what Lamia Mughni calls living in violence and affective experiences that make space, I want to evaluate how representations, specters, and memories of past violence produced borders of containment as a mode of accessing safety and deterring future violence. So with that, I center the formation of informal checkpoints by uh, youth residents of Druze villages and the more volatile checkpoints established by militia groups under the broader camps of the Lebanese nationalist movement and the Lebanese front to look at how experiences 
uh, of fear, outbreaks of violence, lo loss, and the desire for safety profoundly informed how members of the Druze community came to relate to the spaces they inhabit and to each other. I follow the trajectory of the political, social, and visceral developments materializing during the Civil War to try to provide a framework from which to understand how these experiences informed the production of space during the Civil War and afterwards as well. So uh, the story that I'm sharing today begins a few days after the Beirut bus massacre that resulted in the death of over 20 Palestinian commuters by the Lebanese Kate'e party. 13-year-old Taha stood in the entryway of his family's building with his brother's hunting rifle after hearing echoes of gunshots that he assumed originated from the neighboring Christian village. Taha stood on the stoop of his apartment where a few more relatives joined and had conversations about the proximity of the violence to their village. The discussions eventually enticed Taha and his relatives to throw stones onto the main roadway connecting their village to the Christian one. And Taha said that after they gained some courage, he and some of the relatives decided to stop commuters and ask for their ident identification cards. He recalled realizing how people were stopping for them even though they weren't an actual militia, which he described as an exhilarating feeling. While reflecting on the newly found sense of power and authority almost 50 years prior, Daha's demeanor shifted from one of a poised interlocutor to a very enthusiastic storyteller. And he described many reasons for uh, deciding to establish the checkpoints. First, he claimed that checkpoints helped define the boundaries of the village and safeguarded it from potential act of violence. Second, he mentioned the desire to align himself and his village more broadly with what they perceived as a revolutionary movement, positioning themselves as pro-Palestinian and anti-government during the early days of the war. Third, he described the desire to protect his village and the Druze community specifically from the alleged looming threat of their Christian neighbors. And the fourth explanation came years after our initial conversation. Daha and his cousin Hassan, who interjected into the conversation, both discussed being young, out of school, and bored. Over years of fieldwork, the rationale behind their checkpoint formations shifted with whatever contemporary political circumstances were materiali materializing within Lebanon and the region more broadly. The temporal slippages consistently reconfigured our conversations and exposed how time changed the political and social logic behind forming these checkpoints as one's participation um, and forming the checkpoints came to be entangled with the violence of the present. So representations and memories were shaped by matters like the Syrian civil war, the May 9, 2008 fighting against Hezbollah, and even events like the October uprising of 2019. And despite the fluctuation in how one positions themselves vis-a-vis -vis the civil war, however, it became apparent that the affective experiences of violence and the desire for safety tell us the important story of how sectarianized space continues to be produced in Lebanon. More specifically, Taha's story sheds light on how feelings of fear and uncertainty brought forth the impulse to seek communal solidarity and safety amongst the Druze res residents of his village, regardless of their intercom intercommunal affiliation. So regardless if they followed uh, Jean Blatt or Erslan, for example. So Taha and his relatives had yet to become official members of the Lebanese nationalist movement, but they nonetheless came to inadvertently represent the LNM at checkpoints they formed in 1975. They participated in the militarization of their village through their armed manning of checkpoints and the subjecting of travelers to their interrogations, to the potentiality of their violence, and to their authority. In many of our conversations, Taha maintained that the formation of checkpoints materialized into res in response to the threat of violence or encroaching violence, which helped create a notion of safety, or at least fostered the impression of forming a boundary to keep violence at bay. Since they had not engaged in acts of violence or participated in the bloodshed, at least while the checkpoints remained informal, the youth considered their participation as innocuous, which allowed them to maintain a relatively clear conscience when having a conversation with me. Daha saw the establishment of checkpoints as a preemptive strategy and emphasized in our conversations, and this is a quote, that we had to make our presence known and show our force to make sure we prevented anyone from trying anything on our village. We had to keep our village safe. It was just a show of force. We were kids. I honestly don't know what we would have done if anything ever happened, uh, but it was just about showing force for us. By framing the implementation of checkpoints as a pursuit of safety, however, 
Those manning the checkpoints minimized the hostile and unsafe conditions they created for residents of neighboring villages. Despite the innocence claimed on behalf of himself and his relatives, Daha's understanding of the lack of violence as key to making their checkpoints inconsequential is disputable. The basic practice of crossing a checkpoint is coercive in its very nature as it aims to produce disciplinarity through fear. The process of slowing down, having your papers ready, turning on your light in the car, greet and greeting those operating the checkpoints means succumbing to their authority, which are all vital mechanisms involved in instilling the power of those manning the checkpoints. And so subjecting Christian commuters to harassment, uncertainty, and the possibility of violence altered the socio-spatial dynamics governing the territory. Armed with hunting rifles and whatever else they were able to find in their homes, the teenage boys became the arbiters of mo mobility and safety in their village. In this sense, regardless of their physical location or their formality or lack thereof, checkpoints functioned as borders that signified limitations or the, or the parameters of sovereignty over a place, particularly due to the atmosphere of surveillance and power hierarchies appearing in the interactions between militia soldiers and the individuals attempting to cross. So despite the lack of violence perpetrated at the checkpoints, Taha and his relative, uh, so despite the lack of violence perpetrated at the checkpoints that Taha and his relatives formed, the affective implications and representations of informal checkpoints extended well beyond the immediate encounters at their specific crossings. Informal checkpoints were heavily influenced by the stories, rumors, and reputations of formal militia checkpoints that were simultaneously emerging throughout the country. As Lisa Widdin elucidates in assessing the deployment of rumors as a mechanism of activating Syria's nervous system in action throughout the Syrian civil war, she says that the steady supply of rumors in circulation helped turn anticip anticipatory fear into a generalized condition of foreboding. Although monopolized by the Syrian regime in the context of Syria, the affective implications of checkpoints helped produce what became actual violence by militarizing spaces as a mechanism through which to avoid violence. So in this sense, the unaffiliated militia checkpoints signified the ruthless violence that was occurring at the formal militia checkpoints in Beirut specifically and in the country as a whole. The militia checkpoints took various forms. Some were stationary bases resembling bunkers, overseeing the movement of civilian populations or warring factions, while others were more impromptu and spontaneously established. It was at these impromptu checkpoints where much of the violence of the civil war materialized, with numerous cases of kidnappings, killings, rapes, and, clash and clashes reportedly occurred. Thousands of abducted, uh, abductions at checkpoints were reported, and the numbers continued to escalate significantly in the cyclical retaliatory attacks that were materializing for the duration of the civil war. For example, on May 30th, 1975, known as Black Thursday, between 30 and 50 Christian civilians were executed in um, West Beirut by the Lebanese nationalist movement militias following the assassination of a Palestinian man in downtown Beirut. After that came Black Saturday, after the discovery of the body of four young Christian men who were kidnapped at checkpo checkpoints in previous weeks. Kate'ib members then established checkpoints near the port district in East Beirut, and this is a quote, and proceeded to kill and, ab and abduct unarmed Lebanese Muslims or Palestinians, most of whom worked at the port. It is reported that between 56 and 70 civilians in East Beirut were found executed, while the fate of 300 others who were kidnapped remains unknown. The impromptu checkpoints created increasingly daunting conditions for Lebanon's residents severely restricting their movements and complicating their mundane practices. The checkpoints not only aimed to instill anxiety and terror in those passing through, but they also intended to haunt residents and commuters with the constantly looming threat of retaliation, vengeance, and surveillance. Many recounted their story, stories of encounters with the LNM or the Lebanese Front and other militias through various oral history projects appearing in Lebanon in the aftermath of the civil war. For example, dealing with the past provides a platform for women survivors of, survivors of the war and relatives of the disappeared to share their stories through interviews, documentaries, art installations, photo series, um, and photo series which highlight the humiliation, violence, and terror experienced at checkpoints. And so the, the um, photos that are on loop here, some of them include uh, uh, some of the projects um, that dealing in the past, dealing with the past uh, 
has done. Um, one contributor discussed waiting to cross a checkpoint in broad daylight and witnessing a 17-year-old girl being asked to step out of her vehicle. The observer watched the rape of the young girl, followed by her murder, and saw how her body was then dumped into the back of the vehicle, presumably to be, to be buried amongst the other thousands of unidentified bodies in one of the mass graves of disappeared throughout Lebanon. Other statements shared how visibly pregnant women were targeted for forced abortions on site, oftentimes resulting in their deaths. It is within this context that the violence unfolding at formal militia checkpoints transcended their immediate spatial and temporal boundaries. By the end of the Civil War, around 17,000 individuals had disappeared, and the circulations of the stories of the disappeared, the rumors of the abductions, rapes, and violence profoundly shaped how people came to navigate space. So in this sense, to go back to Taha and his relatives in their Druze village, in their Druze village, the checkpoints that they established cannot be seen as simply demarcating safety or attempting to contain the borders of violence. On the contrary, checkpoints became broader symbols representing the horrors of the war. So even if the mechanisms employed at the informal checkpoints um, enacted by Taha genuinely served to protect the Druze community, they were simultaneously creating conditions of anxiety, restrictions, and harassment for their Christian neighbors and others who were passing through from the outside. They inherently created an inside and outside binary, an us versus them, especially in the context of circulating stories of executions, rapes, and abductions. The stories of the violence and the anxiety and fear that uh, they induced work to further necessitate roadblocks and checkpoints to contain the violence. Every, for their everyday political developments um, of the civil war, such as the invasion of the Syrian, Israeli, and other armies continue to intensify their already precarious and tumultuous circumstances in Lebanon. But one political event that profoundly affected Taha and the others of the Druze community was the assassination of the Progressive Socialist Party uh, and Lebanese nationalist movement leader Kamal Jamblat in March of 1977. The effects of Jamblat's assassination were felt almost immediately at the informal checkpoint in Taha's village as they turned into formal ones and became key sites of struggles as villagers' sense of security and safety plunged even further. Despite having been the leader of the broader L LNM movement, Kemal Jamblat was a Druze leader after all, Hassan would say to me. His assassination heightened the feelings of fear, of instability and precarity, and created a sense of urgency in protecting the Druze community. And not only were the locals overwhelmed with the loss of Jamblat, but the precarity of the circumstances also impacted the ranks of the Progressive Socialist Party. So while the leadership and membership of the PSV was diverse in their composition, the assassination of Jamblat saw members uh, make way for Kamal's son, Wali Jamblat, to take control of the PSP. One member of the PSP and an interlocutor for the larger project uh, on which this talk is based said to me that they, and this is a quote, were not sure if Wali Jamblat would follow in the footsteps of his father or what was going to happen. But almost immediately, we noticed that we needed to change the recruitment in the Druze. Uh, we needed to change. I'm sorry. Almost immediately, we noticed a change in, in the urgency for Druze recruitment, end quote. So within one year, thousands of Druze entered the party and constituted almost 76% of the recruits in the PSP party in 1978 alone. So in this sense, we see the immediate shift of, of the PSP from a nationalist party heavily involved in the formation of the Lebanese nationalist movement to a predominantly Druze one which tr tremendously restructured how residents of Druze villages related to the party and to the spaces they inhabited and to, and to each other. For example, when speaking with Daha about the aftermath of Jablat's assassination, he recalled sitting in front of his home monitoring traffic when he and his relatives were approached by some elders from within the PSP in the village. Daha, Hassan, and their cousin Mahmoud were told to gather the youth to meet with some PSP members the following day. Upon meeting the PSP elders, the group of youth were given camouflage uniforms and formally joined the PSP and participated in trainings. The teenage boys were taught how to march in unison and participated in target, pra target practice in a makeshift shooting range in a forested area. They practiced uh, by shooting cans and bottles placed on rocks throughout the, 
throughout the woods and had fighters shooting in between their legs as a training exercise to acclimate them for, from the threat of gun violence. Taha says that they hadn't previously joined the PSV because it required a bit of commitment, like attending meetings and receiving political education, a political education of sorts. But after the assassination of Kemal Jablat, they described the feeling a sense of urgency and excitement when approached by the PSP elders. The affective implication of implications of Jamblat's assassination created feelings of protectiveness, of pride, and of honor. When speaking with Hassan, he recalled the heart-wrenching moment when he saw Yasser Arafat's reaction to Jamblat's assassination while in the Palace, uh, Palestine National Council meeting in Cairo. He described how he saw Yasser Arafat break down crying and then this is a quote that Yasser Arafat said, that it is a tragedy for us. Jamblat was the equivalent of several armies fighting on our side. Hassan described feeling his heart sink and realizing that for the first time, he had a genuine desire to fight for the cause. What the cause was at that particular moment also differs depending on when we spoke. But he also officially joined the PSP shortly after uh, Jamblat's assassination. The mass recruitment of uh, PSP members without formal political or ideological training shifted the characteristics of the party to one mostly relying on sectarian membership rather than the political participation of like-minded individuals. This becomes clear in examining the statistics of the religious composition of the party before 1977 and after. From the founding of the PSP until the assass assassination of Jamblat, the membership had included a diverse mix of religious sects, where around 47% of the membership compri comprised of non druze individuals, whereas after 1978, almost 82% of the party was made up of Druze members. The PSP under Kamal Jamblat held socialist values and centered broader decolonial struggles, particularly the decolonization of Palestine. After Jamblat's assassination, the political goal shifts inward. The priority for many of my interlocutors became protecting the Druze community and the honorable party of their assassinated leader, as Hassan said. So the Druzification of the PSP then saw the intensification of checkpoints throughout many Druze neighborhoods where form firmer protocols came to be imposed. Kidnappings, detentions, assaults, confiscation of weapons and cars and killings began occurring at what was formally described that as benign checkpoints. And at this point, the combination of these conditions resulted in increased internal migration, which saw more than a third of Lebanon's population of 3 million people uh, ultimately involved in internal displacement. And the migration of people to religiously homogenous enclaves for their protection and access to resources worked to disrupt, uh, disrupt the distribution of public services because municipal workers in many regions had disappeared and the responsibility of distributing food and water and picking up garbage and running electrical generators shifted into the hands of militias. In this sense, the youth-led informal militias that had materialized in dozens of villages and towns across the country became repurposed to serve the political interests of the specific militias and parties that claimed the territorial sovereignty in the area. The assassination of Jablat and the broader political developments from the Syrian and Israeli invasions of Lebanon, the exiling of the PLO from the country, the Sabra and Shatila massacres of 1982, where approximately 4,000 Palestinians were executed, to the Mountain War of 1982, all came to complicate mobility even further. And this, of course, led to increased reliance on sect-based militias for security, resources, and infrastructure. Navigating these precarious conditions reinforced the role of the militia as the protector, as the group that would and could define the boundaries of violence. To briefly turn back to Lamia Mohnia, when she said that, uh, and this is a quote, everyday readings of violence determine crucial life decisions about whether to move out of the neighborhood or stay there, go to work as usual or remain home, buy more food just in case or just a regular amount, and take the same route to work or avoid certain roads, end quote. Often, these decisions became dependent on the mobilization of the militia, their checkpoints and their assessment of safety determined which roads would be blocked off, what routes would be interrupted, and the community murmurs would give one a sense of the conditions of that particular day. 
So this mechanism of affective governance, of navigating the strategies of governance based on the proximity to violence, its specter or its perpetuation, I argue, produced the geographies of war that served as the blueprint for the post-war political and material landscape in Lebanon. The conditions of precarity and the violence helped establish, help establish relationships between specific spaces and their residents. And despite the culmination of the civil war in 1990 to between 1990 and between 1992, uh, the specters of violence and their affective implications continued to impact the production of space in the post-war era, which saw Dru's leaders solidify their authority by mobilizing their own institutionalization in the political sphere, both nationally and locally. In this sense, visible acts of violence became less frequent while transitioning into the post-war period, but the experiences and memories of violence continued to play a crucial role in the institutionalization of militias in governance, again, on a national and local scale. And I argue that this materializes as such because feeling safe and secure does not magically appear when a ceasefire is announced. On the contrary, as those responsible for per for perpetuating violence and establish, establishing checkpoints where kidnappings, executions, massacres, mutilations, and bombings occurred came to rule the country. Every corner, building, lobby, walkway, balcony, and the, whole mat and the materiality of the landscape of the country carried the lingering presence of the violence, the enduring aftermath of the war, the unsettling reminder of an always only temporary peace. And I'll end this by saying that in Lebanon, uh, the violence of the civil war is, of course, unforgettable. It persists, it resurfaces, it transforms, and it consistently forges new alliances to sustain the geographies of war that appeared during the civil war. And perhaps where it's made mo most apparent is in the reproduction of sectarian communities nearly 50 years after the civil war started. But as Joanne Nujo reminds us, community is an ongoing project, something that comes into being only with collective effort. So if in the Druze case, the community appears in the pro productivity of disruptions, violence, and precarity, then its materiality relies on the permeating of space, both physically and through its haunting presence. Thank you. Thank you so much to all of you for these very engaging um, talks. We have about 15 minutes for Q&A, and I, and I have a few questions, but since we only have 15 minutes, I'm going to start by asking the presenters themselves if they have any questions for each other, because your work is in conversation with each other. I, and then I'm going to open it up to the audience. But I wanted to give you a chance. Yeah. You want to hear from the audience? OK, great. So I will open it up. Just raise your hand and someone will bring you a mic. Someone's got a hand up back there. Uh, the mics are here. Okay. Yes, I will ask my questions too. Good evening. Um, thank you, everybody, for this uh, amazing lecture. Um, thank you, Dr. Lara, also for the interesting real-life examples. Um, I agree with you that um, if we don't understand the spiritual meaning of marriage, as described in the manuscripts of Tawheed, um, and the ultimate spiritual mating, which is the aim of marriage in Tawheed, it's very challenging to explain for generations, especially Alpha and Beta, the coming, why shouldn't you marry from outside the religion? The question is... Um, um, the the uh, the situation in the Middle East and in other countries. How much is it challenging? Because um, you will face all these um, like things related to your existence when somebody um, is open and secular versus when the other for them is not that open or not that secular. So is it only the problem of Druze? This is a question and. Um, for, um, it looks like Dr. Castrino visited one side of the story in the Golan Heights, um, but not the other. While some Druze are, do align with the narrative um, that she said, others definitely don't. Especially, um, I recall many government officials and high-ranked military personnel in the state of Israel and the IDF 
who are originally from the Golan Heights. Uh, plus, um, I don't think that acknowledging the challenging critical situation of the Druze minority in the Golan Heights should also mean perpetuating the Iranian slash Hamas narrative of accusing the state of Israel for committing genocide. I mean, I don't recall any genocide of the state of Israel against the Druze in Golan. And I can't also say that Israel is committing genocide when the highest international court did not. So um, that's just some ideas. Thank you. Um, we're going to take one more question, just in the interest of time, and then we have a question here, and then we'll give the panelists a chance to respond. And since we don't have that much time, if we yeah, can try to brief. keep our questions to questions, yeah. yes, thank Especially you. Especially after this question, I'll be very brief. Uh, the question is for Maria. Uh, Maria, uh, I really enjoyed hearing your presentation. Uh, for us who are Druze here, there is a famous saying that in times of crisis, the Druze are willing to sacrifice their children rather than sacrifice their land. You know, in Arabic, uh, my question is, um, the situation of the Druze in Israel and the Golan, right? You made it seem like the Druze of Israel stayed there because they struck a deal with the, with the Zionists, uh, where I always felt that, that their decision to stay there is their attachment to the land. The second part of my question is pertaining to the Golan Heights. As you know, Donald Trump uh, told the Israelis, you can, get, you can have the Golan Heights. And I noticed some maps now of Israel show the Golan Heights as being part of Israel. Uh, did the decision uh, to, to uh, authorize Israel to annex the Golan Heights, did that impact the Druze community on the Golan Heights? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you for that question. And we have one question. Here? Yes. Hello, um, I'm Mark Dow. Um, my question is related to Lara's research as well, uh, because following up on the high rate of mixed marriages, as, as you defined them, uh, the issue of where do the spouses get married is becoming a massive issue in Druze villages. Uh, because people are not accepting non-Druze wives being buried in Druze cemeteries. So I want to see if you had a chance to cover that in addition to public spaces, uh, town halls, are they allowed to have receptions or uh, funerals, etc. So I want to see if you had that discussion with us. Okay, thank you. I think we have enough questions to start with. Yes. Is this, oh, I can't get out. Is this Is on? on? Can you all hear me without the mic? I think I'm pretty loud. Yes. Okay. It's on. It's on. Okay. Better with the mic. Okay. There we go. The mic is on. Um, so the first um, question asked me, is it only, no, it's not only Drews, right? So um, among, I told you among my interviewees, um, I found 19% of my interviews were Drews, but we have the, those statistics I gave you from 2018. It's among Lebanese married to other Lebanese, 18% of those marriages or 16% of those marriages involve at least one Drews spouse, which means 100 minus 16% involve other people getting married in Lebanon in mixed marriages. So no, it's not only among Druze. Um, the thing that is specific is that in every other sect, it is actually, you know, in every other sect except Syriac Christians, it is slightly easier for men to marry outside the sect than women. Whereas for Druze, it is equally difficult once you get to marriage for both men and women, for the reasons I, some of the reasons I described. But the kinds of arguments parents make cut across different religious groups, the kinds of protests, and that's actually kind of one of my points that I make in the book is that it comes down to all of these social factors that are shared among Lebanese, no matter what their sectarian background. Um, and then the question of burial, yeah, this is, and it's, that's again, not only a question with Druze, but one of the problems in Lebanon is that and that cemeteries are religious, right? So this doesn't go back to personal status law, but it is one of the big problem, the biggest problems people actually face in mixed marriages are 
after somebody dies, problems of inheritance and problems of burial. And it keeps people in mixed marriages up at night. People don't know what to do. People debate it. People think about it of all combinations, whether a Druze is involved or not. I have, you know, people who are wealthier will buy a little plot of land so that they can be buried together. Other people resign themselves that one spouse will be in their family cemetery and the other one will be in another one and their kids will have to visit them in two different places. It's a huge, one person was calling the AUH, the American University, AUBMC now, medical center, and asking if they do illegal cremations. It just, it, people are really struggling with this. And that's one of the big problem, one of the many big problems for mixed marriage, mixed couples. Yeah. I also, one last thing I'll say is there are, I have heard stories. So most Druze sheikhs will not pray over somebody, not only the spouse, but even the person in the mixed marriage or their parents. I have heard rumor, I'll say, of two I will not, I, I don't have their names with me, so I couldn't say even if I wanted to, who will do so. Um, and people are also using their networks to find those specific uh, sheikhs and, and get around it in those ways. Maria? Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. Okay, so um, thank you. First of all, to say that obviously the ICJ is still working, but most of the uh, organizations the, the UN is describing the catastrophe that's going on in uh, in Gaza at the moment as genocide. And for all of us who see the 35,000 people who have died, uh, we actually don't know how many more the killing of women and children. I mean, I don't have another word to call it. How else can you? How else can you call it, right? Um, of course, anthropological research is always is, is not one-sided or it is the, the result of our engagements, of our engagements with the people that we work, the people that we live. So the, the point of anthropological research is not to, to, to present one side or another side in a kind of, uh, you know, the way that perhaps the BBC would present it, but to understand the stories of the people they tell. And that's why we actually spend a lot of time uh, in a place. So I've been, I've been working on and off in the Golan Heights since 2008. I don't have, uh, we don't have big samples of surveys, but we have intimate connections. The complexity of life stories that uh, people who live there. Um, and this is, this is the basis of what, this forms the basis of what we write and the, the richness of what as anthropologists we bring about. And I think, uh, you know, when you look at things like the cemeteries, when you look at the geographic uh, um, uh, impacts of status, of how space and place is used in a place, then it's very difficult to question whether resistance is not part of the experience of being Jolani. Even though, yes, there is a rise in people taking citizenship and the citizenship is a very convoluted theme that I try to explore in my own research. And hence, I was very much surprised when I interviewed this, uh, this man who is the, the, the child of, you know, the, the, the first the, um, uh, and most pronounced uh, uh, person who took Israeli citizenship uh, very proudly. And he said, yes, this, uh, this was my life. It was very difficult as a child, but I still feel Syrian. So for me, as an anthropologist, this is really, really interesting, really strange. It's a kind of grayness of the identity of peoples and people's connections that doesn't buy, doesn't, uh, cannot be reduced to what is Druze or what is, um, it's, it's, it's place-based, this, this kind of productive identity that evades our own ways to, to contain it in, in words and identifications. The other point in your question, thank you very much, is that uh, the, um, the Druze in the Golan Heights, first of all, they don't like to be known as Druze. It's very difficult to talk to them about that. They prefer themselves to, uh, to, be, to be called uh, Syrian stateless people. And this is because precisely of the Israeli tactics of carrot and stick. 
and the use of sectarianization of their identity in their claims to their lands and political belonging, right? And, and they see very well the second class citizens of their Palestinian Jews brethren in Israel. And by the fact that they have uh, since the occupation um, made uh, an open resistance, the the, the Mukauma in, in the Golan Heights has become also much more professionalized, much more highly educated people that have uh, built uh, autonomous organizations. Um, that is really, really interesting. And and the people from the the people from the Golan, they are very different from the Palestinian Druze. So they are different, different people. They do not serve in the IDF. They have the status of East Jerusalem um, Palestinians. And even if uh, they choose to, 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 to go to, um, to take the citizenship, uh, the Israeli citizenship, they're not expected to uh, to serve in the military and uh, um, they they don't and I'm like I, I don't know of anybody who has become um, uh, uh, like a military leader for example um, and I think it's it's very it's it's very important to to connote this difference between the the, the, the two communities that, you know, are not shared, the people of the Jolan, and I'm, I'm sorry if I'm taking too much, no, so, too much time to explain no, that, please, please. Um, but it's, it's, it's really quite important. They have more marriage relations with Jaramana and Sueda than they have with the Jalil, right? Um, so, so the kind of the, the the opening up of their identity is uh, is Syrian, and this is kind of you know remarkable. Um, and of course, the the kind of understandings of citizenships generally are changing. Why people um, um, go for it or not? But I think yeah, the the kind of cultural and memorial and identification, the connection to the land um, and to this, all, all the other, um, yeah, uh, connections is, is, a, is a draw towards a different direction and uh, uh, quite remarkable because they've had such a difficult time uh, for 57 years uh, and, and yeah, they have, they have continued. So yeah, uh, but, but I have here, and, and I will I will leave the map for anyone who wants to see it later. Um, and this is this is a map produced by the local human rights center in the Golan Al Marshad, um, and it it shows the kind of you know the, uh, destroyed villages, all the all the red and the four that was left to remain. Um, and yeah, happy to take more questions. Thank you so much, Maria. Um, Dima, I, oh, sorry. Yeah, you have a question? Go right ahead. Yes, 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 yes. Uh, I have a question for you, Dima, um, which is that you've described how the affective impacts of violence linger. And I'm wondering how this continues intergenerationally, right? So one way is obviously through the post-war sectarianization of space and geography, but are there other ways that that kind of affective impact of violence are passed down generationally? If I can ask a question to to Dima to add to that one, I was also thinking about um, how does the trend? You were talking about kind of what remains in the space, right? The violence and the ways in which it shapes space and and attachment to space. And I was wondering how you know post war how um, like the transformation of space through urban development and rebuilding. What kinds of effects do those kinds of more contemporary um, space marking, space changing, or <laughs> um, does it transform s some of these relationships, um, communal attachment to particular spates? Um, does it reproduce them or how does it reproduce them and or transform them? Um, so we have a couple of questions in the audience. Would you like, I'm gonna take a couple more. Okay, Namrata, we have a question right there and then. It's almost related to Lara's question, but it's to Dima. Uh, why, when you interviewed these former militiamen, did you experience any sense of remorse or regret or re a reflection on like, what have we done? That's it. 
Maybe we should, Dima, let's let you answer your three questions and we have a few more in the audience and we have a little bit more time. Um, yeah. I'll start with the last one. Uh, it depends on who was around. Uh, it depends on if, if, yeah, if we were sitting in a cafe or somewhere public and people from, you know, like the SSNP were around or if people from, you know, yeah, any other sort of political party, the conversation would look very differently than when we were alone. Um, and I think that it's hard, it's hard to say that there was, whether there was remorse, because I think, again, it gets so caught up with the politics that are happening today um, that it becomes just another thing that Lebanon has had to endure or they've had to endure as like the Druze community. Um, but yeah, I think the primary answer to that would be that it really depends on, on uh, who's around. I will say that there's um, in the well. So I will say that in the in the PowerPoint uh, photos that I had in a loop, there were these. There, there's a project um, where it's called Chairs for the Disappeared, and there was one instance where there was a person who was disappeared, and a person who I had interviewed remembered their involvement in that case. And I, that I, I really did witness um, the, I, I, I don't even, it's remorse, but like so much deeper than that, you know, it was, it was, I, I saw him shatter basically. Um, but, but that was like one instance where I was really able to sort of I, see that. Um, on uh, Lara, your question about the affective uh, impact of violence passed down generationally, um, I think Maria, you touched on this in your in your talk. But when we think of reincarnation and the role of reincarnation in producing in post-war politics amongst the Druze, I think that um, I don't know if this is actually true, but the general idea is that you remember your past life if you died a violent death. So after the post-war, well, for the Druze, um, I think. So after the post, uh, after the war, um, there were a lot of people coming forth, remembering how they died and who killed them and these sort of specific instances. Um, and I think when we saw the, the effects of that in action was in May of 2008, when uh, Hezbollah, um, and the PSP and other Druze uh, community members clashed. Um, in some areas, you know, people who were aligned with Hezbollah said, "We're not going to, you know, we're not going to do this. We're not going to do this again." Um, in some areas, but yeah. Um, and in terms of the. Uh, post-war transformation and the contemporary space changing. Um, yeah, it's, it's, yeah, I don't know. It's hard with Lebanon, I think, because first of all, my, my focus was on Mount Lebanon. So I think it really stays the same um, in terms of like markers of, of, you know, points of violence. Um, but I mean, I think, you know, it's like when the uprising happened in 2019, people gravitate towards certain lines of demarcation of where like East and West Beirut, you know, uh, the crossings to protest there because, of, because it still exists as a symbolic sort of, it exists symbolically, even if um, you no longer have like actual checkpoints there. And I, and also, I mean, the clashes that took place in October of 2018 happened on, you know, the ring bridge. Uh, and so they, ha and even recently as, I'm not, okay, maybe I shouldn't get into all of that, but um, recently between Aina Remeni and Sheyeh, for example, uh, the Lebanese army has had to come and patrol because they're, there's constantly fear of these of, of violence sort of escalating at these meeting points. Thank you. So we have time for a couple of questions. We've got this person right here, and then in the same row, 
And then the third, and we can take that third question and that's it. Okay. Uh, good evening. Thanks very much for a very informative and interesting discussion and answers. Uh, my question relates to the uh, post-war politics and uh, social behavior. You were kind of, um, as you pointed out, the civil war kind of reinforced, reinforced sectarianism in Lebanon and actually led to the political environment to be even much worse. Now we have more this um, religious quota. Before it was just the president, the prime minister. Now every minister has to be from certain sect and you go down through the government structure all the way. And then this correlation between the government, the religious leaders protecting their religious positions and corruption and then kind of feedback loop making things worse. I wonder if through your research um, found from the public um, and general public in Lebanon, if there is a tendency to move toward a civil modern state where we can address some of the issues with um, mixed marriages or basically political corruption uh, or just uh, basically focus, completely separate the state from religion and if there is acceptance for it, if this is really what people want, and if this addresses some of the problems you are talking about. And then specifically, if you see a role, what's the role of religious minorities like Jews? And what's the impact on the religious minorities? Would it be marginalizing these minorities? What the impact if we really move toward this, which would be the ultimate goal? And thanks again. So we have one. And if I can ask just if you can make your question brief, just because we're out of time. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, on the same lines of, uh, of his question, within the PSP, because I know a lot of your research was specialized in that party, do you see any instance in the future where people within the, where the PSP as a party would, would you said, drusification, would de drusification so the opposite of it? Do you see a moment where it would be more about the values of socialism anytime in the future and what context would that be? And just a very another quick question to uh, Dr. Deeb. Does the notion of reincarnation come up at all when talking about mixed marriages? And is it believed that if the spouse is Druze and they're married to a non-Druze, would they still reincarnate? Like, is that something that's a belief that has been talked about or not? Thank you. Thank you. And then a third question there, and then we're going to have to wrap it up. Yeah, thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, for Dr. Deeb, in terms of the stories of uh, mixed marriage, it seems they were mostly urban. So did you, that's, that's good. So did you notice um, any difference in terms of the, the association pressure? Kind of here, it seems here that the kids are not associated, but the parents are, and there's this uh, asymmetry. Are there cases where the kids feel that I want to associate with the community of Druze, and this will shy me apart? This is one. And uh, for Dr. Castrino, I think uh, in terms of the the community in general, it's, it's very hard to home, to generalize. So not all Druze are the same, and not all the Druze in Golan Heights are the same. But it seems community opts to represent itself in specific, specific public spaces. So the square, you said, that's a public representation. This is what the collective. Uh, and what was uh, also revealing to me the, the, the cemeteries, because our burial sites are anonymous. So the community chooses whom to nominate and commemorate. So I think in probably in uh, IDF soldiers, in, in Jalil, they are commemorated, correct? Special cemeteries where they are, they have names. And, and this is a parallel in Golan Heights, it is people who died fighting against. So I think that just kind of to get away from the, 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 uh, the anecdotes to look at the community and what it's telling us. I think that's revealing. So thank thank you. you very much. Thanks. And so if I can ask you all to keep your responses brief, because uh, yes, thank you, please. Okay, I'll go first and I'll try to be very quick. Um, move, uh, movement to civil state, I'm just going to say one thing obliquely to this. When I said the 16% 6, of mixed marriages among Lebanese involve a Druze, if we look at all the mixed marriages in Lebanon, we're talking about 5% of all Lebanese marriages, maybe. So it's a really small percentage of Lebanese who are in mixed marriages across all sects. So that's just for some context. Um, that's one. Uh, reincarnation. Uh, most people would say that 
know a person in a mixed marriage, neither the person in the mixed marriage nor their spouse will be reincarnated, nor their, ch and there's debate about the children. Um, people didn't agree on that. But what I, yeah, but I, again, I, what I said at the beginning of my talk is people who believe in reincarnation are not in mixed marriages. Um, at least I did not interview anybody who is in a mixed marriage who believes in reincarnation. So there's also a, um, that's part of it. Village versus urban. Some people in who were, so the people I described, you're right, most of them, their parents were more connected to the villages than they were, except for Adnan, who truly, I mean, the reason it took him 12 years to marry his non Drew's girlfriend is that he himself was trying to maintain that village role in those establishments. And he eventually got to the point where he basically stood up for himself and said, I'm going to marry her. And I will also maintain my wedge in the village. And it worked mm -hmm. because he's privileged. And because he's male, most Drew's women I interviewed who grew up in villages had to elope. Um, and that's a place where there's a bit more of a difference. A lot of Drew's men also eloped in villages. Very few stories in cities eloped, except again, the story I shared at the beginning of a, one of the young cousins who grew, was born and raised in Beirut and she eloped. So it's an imperfect correlation, but not a, yeah. But there were quite a few in villages too. Thank you. All right. Yeah. Or, yeah. Oh, oh, yeah. Yes. Yeah, yes. Okay. Yeah. I mean, thank you very much. This is this is the, the point of the paper, really, that uh, you can see all these things. The, you can see the the cemeteries, uh, the representation, um, the songs that people sing when they come together in bostans, in in the cherry orchards that the, that they have. These are the the memories of the strike. That uh, is a kind of you know the, the the genesis of the community is almost that memory of the of the strike, and yes, there are obviously different opinions, but uh, um, these are these are important elements I think and I feel of belonging and of being Jolani, and they are kind of you know I, I mentioned in my in my presentation the word insurgent. They're kind of you know kind of entities, kind of things that you cannot completely control. So like having a reincarnation when you're in a, an atheist, or like the kind of uneasy existence of uh, Shahid martyrdom with reincarnation and with leftist, very leftist, oppositional and radical. In a lot of cases, you know, a, a lot of, the, of 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 these people are quite uh, you know they they have been through prisons they they are radicalized so you have all of these uneasy things and in terms of anthropology i think these these are the things that you cannot contain the connections that you know the states occupying and not try to contain and to, to build in in monolithic kinds of identities and they almost already you know um escape in a sense also it is uh, you know as a state whether occupying or not it is very difficult to contain and to kill those people who are not afraid to die. Um, but. Thank you. Dima? Um, so in terms of the question about moving towards a civil state, um, I think that you know, as time goes on, um, the governmentality of sectarianism gets intensified. And I think if the last few years have shown us anything, it's that sectarianism as a governmentality is not going anywhere. Like the August 4th explosion didn't change anything. The economic collapse, people losing all of their money and their savings didn't change anything. Zero hours of electricity, you know, didn't change anything. So the the structure of sectarianism just is is durable it's really strong for some reason um and in terms of the the drusification of the psp I, maybe if like a man from blood reincarnates <laughs> and, comes back and start you know takes over um from like Taimur and walid yeah. but i yeah i don't see it happening i mean i think it's it's an extension of the sort of this the the intensification of sectarianism over the last you know i mean since the civil war but even more so over the last like 10 20 years um and 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 we're seeing that also not just with i mean a lot of parties are moving away from what their initial um ideological purpose was right we see that happening throughout the country and so i think this is just a trend that unfortunately is going to keep on happening thank you so please join me in thanking our speakers for a very engaging evening.
So I'd like to invite you, um, there'll be folks guiding you to the center. We have a reception and an art exhibit. And for those of you who um, are joining our dinner, who bought tickets for dinner, that will be followed shortly after the reception in the same space. So, and our speakers will be there. So if you have, if you want to continue the conversation, we'll meet you there. We're on our way. Thank you so much. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Yes.